I'm so excited about what God is doing. It's a little hard to enter back into teaching, but I hope this will give a, a foundation for what we're shifting into. And, uh, and we'll have more time to worship in just a little bit. So we're going to be looking at the month of Tishri and First Fruits. Uh, that's Gil's talk. So we'll get <laughs> you get double portion tonight because it's the first of the month, the Hebraic month of Tishri, and it's the head of the year. And so we get to enter into that new year. So I'm going to teach on the first of the month, and he'll teach on the first of the year. God's original calendar. Just going to briefly go over why we practice first fruits and what that's all about. God originally put the calendar in the sky. In Genesis 1:14, it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and for years. That was the original calendar. And in the midst of that calendar, God created uh, the appointed times for us to meet with him. And these are the, the, the day and the night that we have those appointed times with him. Then we count off seven days to the weekly Shabbat. And then once a month at the beginning of the month, which is the new moon, that's how they would tell that the new moon was there. Now, in scripture, it calls it the new moon festival. But because that sounds kind of new agey, we prefer to call it first fruits, giving our first to God, the first of our month to God. And then finally, the yearly cycles, which Gil will talk about more in just a minute. And so why first fruits and what do we do on first fruits? It's the time to give him the first of our months, to give that worship and that celebration. I love what we've already entered into. We're going to do a whole lot more of that. This verse from Isaiah 66, 23 is just a foretaste. Uh, it's a prophetic foretaste of what it's going to be like, that from Sabbath to Sabbath, from new moon to new moon, we would worship the Lord. God never intended us for us to stop. It was man who goes, oh, let's get a different system. Let's go this way. Let's do this. This is God's original pattern that he designed in the very beginning. And he intended for that to be carried forward throughout eternity. Not in a legalistic way. Some people go, well, that's all Jewish stuff. Why would you do that? Well, God, under with Jesus, you don't have to keep these appointed times with God. You don't have to. You're free not to do that. But there's a blessing when we flow in God's timing. And so why wouldn't you want to celebrate? Then it's a time of giving of our resources. There was first fruit giving at the beginning of the month. There was offerings that were given. Now sometimes when we look at the, the Old Testament, we go, yeah, they had all these different offerings, and there was a sin offering, and there was this offering, and, and oh, you know, I'm so glad we live in this day where we don't have to worry about all those things. We just do our tithe and maybe a little bit of offering here. You know, there's a reason why God had all of those. And when we look at who God is, He is a giver. Think about all the things that He's already given you today. Take it a deep breath. Wow, He's giving you breath. He's giving you life, okay? Yeah. Well, you're here and we just had a great meal. He's given provision for you. You have a roof over your head. He saved your life. And He pours into you the Holy Spirit. And he gives you gifts. And we could go on and on about all the different ways that God gives to you. And guess what? We're made in his image. He created us to be givers in return. And so we change our perspective instead of going, oh man, all these different types of offerings. Why don't they just be more simple and, you know, just throw a couple bucks in. No, it's intentional. Because when we give, whatever we give, either with our money, with our talents, with our resources, with our time, we're reflecting the glory and beauty of who our God is. And when we do that, it, it, He flows through us and it releases something that doesn't happen when we hold back and don't give. And so here at Kingdom Equipping Center, you know, we encourage uh, whatever, how God moves you, but we specifically do first grades. Now some people go, well, isn't that just time? No, it was different. In their agricultural society, in the first part of their crop, or the firstborn of their cattle, or whatever else, that was dedicated to God. And it's not about the portion or size, it's just whatever is first. And then they would go until the end of the harvest, and they would add up all, how many bushels of wheat came in, or barley, or whatever, 
And then they would figure out 10% of that and give that as their tithe. And so first fruits and tithe are very different. First fruits is at the beginning, and tithe is at the end of when you've figured out what you've made that month. Does that make sense? And so we just want to give that opportunity every month for you to give the first of your money because when you give God the first, he blesses all the rest. And so we just encourage you in that to reflect God in giving. And then another part of first fruits is gaining uh, prophetic guidance. Second Kings 4.23, we read and it talks about how from Sabbath to Sabbath and from new moons, the, they would seek out the prophet. It's like a new season and you go, okay, what's, what's for the week ahead? What's the word of the Lord? Or what's for the month ahead? What is the Lord speaking? And so we'll do that in a little bit to talk more about the prophetic angle of it. And then, my favorite, feast time. First fruits was a time to feast and enjoy fellowship. Now when I was making this PowerPoint, I was like, give, give of our time, give of our offerings, gain prophetic guidance, uh, gain weight as we eat. No, <laughs> I didn't think that would go over too well, but anyway. So when we look at scripture, there is so much feasting and fellowship. God loves a good party. And that's why we have our fellowship time. It, it is a lot of extra work, but we really believe in doing life together. And so we encourage you as often as you can to come at 5 o'clock for our potluck time of just fellowshipping together. So we're going to look at the month of Tishri. Tishri is the seventh month, and so it's a, that completion or fullness. God loves the number seven. We see it throughout scripture over and over again. Very special. This was interesting. The original name of this month was Ithinium. I'm probably not pronouncing this correctly. But it says in 1 Kings 8.2, Therefore all the men of Israel assembled with King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ithium, which is the seventh month. And this Ithium means unwavering flag, flame or a steady flow. Now, I believe we're in for some pretty turbulent times ahead. But God's plan for you this month is a steady flow as you keep your eyes fixed on Him. That He's given us the Holy Spirit, which is that unwavering fl flame within us. And as we keep our eyes fixed on Him, we're able to go through whatever chaos comes, whatever challenges come, whatever problems we're face, facing with that steady flow. Does that make sense? All right. This is also the month of the fall feast. It's a time of returning to God and experiencing His glory. Now, my husband's going to talk more about this in a minute, so I'm not going to go very deeply into this, but... This month, 75% of the month was to be spent in these feasts. And that's amazing. 21 days. So the first is what we're entering in today, which is Rosh Hashanah, the Hebrew New Year, or head of the year. So you can turn to your neighbor and say, Happy New Year. It was celebrated for two days, and then we have 10 days of awe, which is just contemplating who God is and, and so on. My husband will talk more about that. Then there was the Day of Atonement, and this was a fasting day. But this is interesting, because sometimes we get super uh, religious and go like, God loves it, but we fast, and we do all kinds of fasting, and we got to fast, and that's it. But when you look in Scripture, the only designated fast on a regular basis is the Day of Atonement. The rest of the time, he's all about feasting. And that doesn't mean that we call special fasts for different reasons, but to have that balance that God is God of relationship and he loves it when his kids get together and we relate to him and we relate to one another. And then the Feast of Tabernacles and again, my husband will go more into that in a little bit. This was also the month that Jesus was most likely born and this is one of my favorite things is when you begin to, begin to see the prophetic puzzle, how God has put, there's, there's specific timing. It's not random, it's not like Jesus came at, you know, a random date, or that he died at a random date. All of it fits into God's calendar, and it's so amazing. So Christ's birth, you go, well, how do you know the exact time? Um, this is approximate, but Luke 1, 5-9, it says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. 
So it was that while he was serving as a priest before the Lord in the order of the division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense. We know the rest of the story. The angel appeared to him and prophesied. And we read this, and we just, okay, I, I don't know whether the division of Abijah has anything to do with or when that was. But because the Jews kept such good records that we can look historically at when that was. So, the division of Abijah served during the month of Tammuz, which is in that June-July timing in our calendar. So, likely, I mean, if you, Zacharias got this prophetic word and said, your wife's going to get pregnant, we're assuming that he went home and he followed up on that prophetic word. And so that most likely, Elizabeth conceived the next month, the month of Av. Now, Scripture tells us that Mary conceives in Elizabeth's sixth month, likely on Hanukkah. And again, I love this, how God did all of these things. Hanukkah is the festival of lights. Jesus, the light of the world, was conceived during Hanukkah. And now, that would have meant that John was likely born on or around Passover. Now, this is significant because the Jewish people to this day, when they celebrate Passover, they're expecting Elijah to come, and they set a chair for him at the, at the table, and they open the door for him, look for him, and all of this. Well, Jesus said, if you're able to receive it, John the Baptist is Elijah. It came in the spirit of Elijah. And so John fulfilled that by being born at Passover. And then that would have likely meant that Jesus was born during the Feast of Tabernacles. Emmanuel, God with us. And I love this so much. Because the Feast of Tabernacles is all about, here the, they're in the wilderness and they're all in tents. And God looks down and he goes, I want to come live in a tent with you too. I want to be among you. And so he comes down. And, and so that's what this feast represents. And so how appropriate that at the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus, the Son of God, would leave his throne, would come in and put on human skin, our tent, and dwell among us. It fits perfectly. It's beautiful. Isn't that so much better than Santa Claus? And all of that? <laughs> now, although my husband would probably like to get rid of Christmas, um, we don't teach that, is that any time when Christ is lifted up and people are thinking of him, we want to celebrate. And so this isn't that we put down all of those other things, but we recognize it for what it is, that it's a pagan holiday, that man change the dates, and put things to get us out of God's timing. So because of this month, with, when Jesus was born, and it's the new year, you can turn to your neighbor and say, Happy New Year and Merry Christmas. <laughs> okay, when, when we look at the Hebrew letter that represents this month, it is uh, Lamed. It's the 12th letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and this is significant too because it's the central letter, and it's the tallest letter. And in the pictograph, it represented a staff, like a shepherd's staff. And one of the meanings of it is king of kings. And so again, this tie-in with Jesus come to dwell with us. The tribe associated with this month is Ephraim. He was the second son of Joseph. But he received the birthright of the firstborn. And if you remember the story, Jacob was going to bless Joseph's sons and had his hands out like this, or like this. And Joseph's like, no, 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 this is the firstborn, that's the secondborn. And he said, no, this is the way it's going to be. So Ephraim, even though he was the secondborn, he received the birthright of the firstborn. And his name means double fruit or double portion. Because when Joseph, when he was born, Joseph said, For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. And so when you think about this month, God wants you to be fruitful and to multiply this month. He wants to give you that double portion. And even if it's been a tough season, if you feel like you've been in that land of affliction, God's saying, I want to give you that double portion as you faithfully seek my face. Now we want to look at Ephraim's legacy. Interestingly enough, Joseph, uh, Joshua and Samuel were both from the tribe of Ephraim. But so was Jeroboam, who led Israel into idolatry and sin. Over 20,000 warriors of Ephraim came to help David when he was uh, crowned king in Hebron. And then Psalms 80 and Psalms 108, the Lord calls Ephraim the helmet of his head. 
But there's some other things that aren't so great about Ephraim and his legacy. Psalm 78 says that Eph the Ephraim men were trained archers, but they turned back in the day of battle. And so Judah was chosen to lead. And this is interesting. I don't understand all of it because this is the head of the year of Ephraim. Judah is the first month, represents the first month. And Ephraim was trained, ready for battle. The day of battle turned back. I don't know why. Maybe fear, discouragement, confusion, whatever it is. And did not enter into that place of battle. And because of that, they lost that place and went to Judah as the leader. But as you continue on through scripture, it's interesting that Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel describe contention between Ephraim and Judah, but that ultimately they would be reunited. Zechariah 9.13 says, For I have bent Judah my bow, and fitted the bow with Ephraim as an arrow, and raised up your sons, O Zion, against your sons of Greece, and made you like the sword of a mighty man. And so there's this prophetic word, of Ephraim and Judah coming back together as a bow and arrow in the Lord's hands. So that redemptive place. That even if you've gotten off, even if in the past you have turned back in the day of battle because of fear or whatever, God wants to bring that restoration, wants to bring you back into that place of moving forward as you connect in the body of Christ. And then finally, the last reference in the Old Testament of Ephraim is Zechariah 10.7. Those of Ephraim shall be like a mighty man, and their heart shall rejoice as if with wine. Yes, their children shall see it and be glad, and their heart shall rejoice in the Lord. And so there's this prophetic word over Ephraim that even though he messed up, even though you know he got off track, and there were some consequences to that, that there's this restoration, that he is called to be a mighty man of valor, and that God would take him into that place of rejoicing and celebration. And so that is our joy today. Do we have time for? No. All right. Well, okay, so we're, we may come back. She's got another piece that she's going to do, and I really would like her to be able to do it. However, um, we're going to go ahead and keep moving because in order to have the right timing down, I'm going to have to go ahead and give my, my talk really quick. We're going to have some worship in between, but I'm going to go ahead and go through this, um, and I hope we can come back to that imagined slide. So real quickly, the Kingdom Equipping Center is about equipping everybody and helping you understand uh, what, what it means to get into God's timing. That is one of the pieces of we, that we feel is valuable. That How many of you have ever missed an opportunity? Okay? You know, God has opportunities for us time after time after time. However, many times we're not in His timing. We're, we're not in the right place doing the right thing at the right time. And God has appointed times, appointed seasons, and... These, this word moed, the word for feasts, so the feasts of God, these are God's appointed times. They're his appointed places, his appointed meetings. The enemy has a plan for us, right? He has a plan that wants to take us down, 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 down. If we have a garden, we just let it go, what happens? Weeds. And if we are left to ourselves, we will simply follow the enemy and the world's ways. We will go down, 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 down. It's a spiral that just takes us down into hell. Bottom line. God has a plan as well, though. And His plan is a plan of redemption. And in His plan of redemption, He wants to clean us up. He wants to purify us, taking out all the stuff that the world throws at us, the mud and the baggage that, it, that the world throws at us and wants to stick. That's the enemy's plan. God wants to redeem us and clean us up. He wants to purify us and fill us with His Word and His Spirit. And then He wants to dwell among us. That's God's plan. It's an upward spiral that goes up, up from glory to glory to glory. That is God's plan. And he had a specific way of doing this. He gave Moses a picture of the tabernacle. He showed it to him in, the, in a vision. So he saw this in heaven. And, and God told Moses to take the picture that he saw in heaven and make a replica of it on earth. Because this is what's going on in heaven. I want you to know what I want you to teach the people what I'm doing in heaven. Teach them on earth. So he made a replica of the tabernacle. And when you come in, you come into the outer court. And the first thing you arrive at is the brazen altar where you confess your sins and there's shedding of blood because the, the sinner would come in, they would bring a sheep, they would lay their hands on that sheep, they would confess their sins and then slit the lamb's throats. And there was the shedding of blood. 
That was at the brazen altar. Then the priest would move forward. He would have to wash himself, removing all the impurities. So again, remember, this is God's plan for us that we have to continually remind ourselves of. And then the priest would move into the most holy place. And at the, in the most holy place, there's the table of showbread, which represents the bread of life, the Torah. And then the Holy Spirit was later given, representing the golden candlestick. And then also this altar of incense, representing the prayers and the communication that we have with God. But then, before he could move into the most holy place, there was the veil. That veil separated the holy place from the most holy place. And the high priest could only go in there once a year. Does anybody know when that day was? Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And if you look at the Day of Atonement, we kind of look at it, at it as at one mint. At one mint. It's where we get to become one with God. And the reason we, get to, we are able to become one with God is because He's removing our sins on that day. So all through the year, when the, the people would come, they confess their sins over the Lamb, the blood which should be shed. It represented the sins of the people. He would take and he would sprinkle that blood into the holy place. But one day a year, the temple was cleansed. And there was a, a bull's blood that the pre high priest would take all the way in to the most holy place. And he would move into the presence of God. But he had been cleansed before he went in. And at that point, he would take the blood of the bull and he would begin sprinkling it there and he would sprinkle it all the way back out representing taking all the sins of the world taking them back out of the temple back out of heaven removing them and there were two goats that were chosen and then lots were, were, were uh, 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 given to each one one was chosen as the sacrificial goat which represented Jesus the other one a scapegoat which represented Satan all the sins were laid on the, the, the uh, scapegoat and take it out into the wilderness where he's left to die. That is the end plan. So once a year, he would go into the most holy place. They would actually have him wear a, uh, on his robe, bells, because only the high priest could go in. And as he was walking around, those bells would jingle. If the bells stopped jingling, it means he had not been fully purified and he'd been struck dead by the presence of God. And so they had a rope tied to his ankle. If, they hear, if the bells stopped ringing, they started dragging. Don't know that that, that ever happened. I've never heard it, that it ever happened, but that was supposedly one of the things that they did. So in the most holy place was His presence, God's glory. So, what did God do? He gave us seven yearly feasts. The Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Pentecost, Rosh Hashanah, Day of Atonement, and, and Tabernacles. You can kind of break them down into three main feasts. The Passover... Pentecost, then you had summer, the summer break, spring feast and fall feast, and then you had the tabernacles, feast of tabernacles. Now, we believe that all the one and two, the first four, the uh, spring feasts, have all been fulfilled in Christ. But the fall feasts are yet to be fulfilled. They will be fulfilled at a second coming. There, there were three times that all the men were required to go to Jerusalem. Three times every year. Why weren't the women told to go? Because they would go anyway. The men had to be told. <laughs> All right, so here are the three times that God commanded that the men would go to Jerusalem. The first one was Passover. What was done at Passover? Passover was remembered. And in remembering the Passover, how many of you have been through a Seder before? All right, fantastic. Then you know a lot about what the Passover is talking about. You would remember the lamb and, the, and the, the lamb that had to be slain and the blood over the doorpost so that the angel of death would pass over and not take the firstborn. It was also the time that they passed over the Red Sea. They had to pass over. We, are, we need to, every season, learn to pass over into the new thing that God has for us. We can't remain stagnant and stale in the same place. Otherwise, the enemy will catch up to us. And then the second feast, Pentecost. What did we do there? On the day of Pentecost, God gave the bread of life. On Mount Sinai, on the day of Pentecost. So the bread of life, Torah, was given. And part of the ritual was to read the Torah and pray that God would give us, and, and, that, and then God also gave His Holy Spirit on that same day. So that's what happens on Pentecost. Then you've got a summer break. And then the third one. So if they went to all three of these festivals, they basically covered all seven festivals. God with us, tabernacles. First of all, there's the Feast of Trumpets. The blast is a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call for all of us to turn. 
When we hear that, it breaks something in the spirit. We are, so if we're headed the wrong direction, that, that trumpet blast stops us. And we turn and we look, we begin to move in the right direction. Because these first 10 days are the days of all when we do begin to examine ourselves to make sure that everything is removed that would separate us from God. And then, as it says there, our sins are removed. And then finally, what we've all been waiting for is when God comes to dwell with us, the Feast of Tabernacles. So that's the exciting thing. So God had the spiral. He has his appointed times to keep us in his timing so that we are moving toward him and not away from him. If we're not in his timing and, and keeping these feasts, it's a lot harder to stay closer to him. These feasts, he designed them. He's the one that made them so that we could be drawn closer to him. And it's interesting when you look at it. So here's the, the tabernacle, or the uh, Moses' tabernacle. And then what did you do? The first one is a feast of Passover. You remember the lamb and the blood and the cleansing from the impurities. And then Pentecost, the table of showbread. Gave, God gave the bread of life, the word, Mount Sinai. And then he gave his Holy Spirit, the lampstand. And it's celebrated by reading and praying. And then you have the summer break. And then you come to the Feast of Tabernacles. The sins are removed and God is with us. God's glory. So this is the temple. The feast that we're set up was a reflection of the temple. God's plan is to keep us in his timing and to keep moving us closer and closer to him. So this to me is very fascinating. We get ourselves into these ruts and these mindsets. And we need to be shifted. We need these paradigm shifts. And so I'm going to show a video clip. And this is about the solar system. Oh, I actually didn't hit it. This is, it's actually a clip about the solar system, but it's so cool because the world wants us to think that we're just going in circles. You know, that's the old model, right? All the planets are going around the circle in the, around the sun. But that's not really what's happening because the sun is moving. And God is moving. God is moving and he wants to take you with it. But you have to choose to move with it. You've got to step out at times and you've got to move with it. So here we go. takes a body to go where he wants to take us. So in our region, we need to think about that. He is wanting to move, but we have to choose to step into the places he's called us to. Each one of you have a destiny and a seed that he's planted, and he wants to bring that to fruition in each one of you. But we can't do it when we just sit stagnant, not moving out, because when he calls, those are opportunities. When he gives us his timetables, those are opportunities. Those are opportunities that he's put there since the beginning of time. When he created the planets, when he created the, the, the universe, the seventh day he rested. It's a Sabbath day. And honestly, there's a blessing in it. He says he sanctified it. He set it apart. So it's very interesting to think that these are blessings that we can step into, that he promises he'll be there. It's his timing. All right. 
So the fall feast are Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And what we're about to celebrate is Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. So if you have a trumpet, I want you to go ahead and get in place. We're, we're getting very close here. Um, about three minutes, and we're going to start a timer. The Feast of Trumpets is also the Hebrew Civil New Year. It's going to start at 717. On that clock, it's going to be 714. And this is also the day Adam was created, 5,776 years ago. And the one command, the one command that God gave for this day is that everyone would hear the trumpet blast. That's the one command because it wakes something up. It breaks things off and it wakes something up within us. Ever since... He used the ram in the thickets for Abraham. Ever since that, God began to use the ram's horn as something that would wake us up and steer us back to him. In the Hebrew, it means alarm or signal, sound of tempest, shout, shout or a blast. So if you don't have a trumpet, then you shout. And it's, it's for war, it's for alarm or for joy. And we are warring in the spirit. We have an enemy. And don't think that all the people out there are, are our enemy. We need to love on them. Just like Larry gave a very good example of that. It takes tact. It takes time. But we need to love on them to show them the difference of what the enemy is doing to them by deceiving them and what God wants to do for them. So the days of awe are right upon us. Tishri 1 through Tishri 10. Yom Kippur. So prepare for his coming. Prepare for his coming by the blast. And, and, and in that 10 days of awe, you're just examining yourself. Examining and asking Holy Spirit, what is there that needs to be removed from me? All right. You ready? This is your wake-up call. We're starting in one minute. So if you want to play a little something, we've got a clock going behind you. Trumpets, get ready. Everybody stand up. And I want you to begin praying.